Well, welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, Nano Explorations uh, seminar. I'm uh, Bob Atkins. I'm your uh, moderator for today. <clears throat> I think we have an exciting talk by uh, Jules Stewart on uh, integrated photonics and electronics for chip scale quantum control of uh, trapped ions. Uh, before we uh, get into that and I uh, introduce our speaker, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, so as you probably know, uh, if you've uh, joined one of these talks before, we are recording the talk, so uh, keep that in mind. I uh, also like to encourage folks to uh, uh, keep your mics muted through the talk and uh, kind of hold your questions until the end. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the talk and uh, uh, you can send those in either through the chat or uh, uh, by raised hands or uh, uh, if that doesn't work by uh, by unmuting and and uh, and yelling out. So we will we'll probably uh, be able to handle all three of those mod modalities. Uh, so uh, with that, let me introduce uh, uh, today's speaker is uh, Jewel Stewart. Uh, he's a grad student uh, working with uh, Ai Chung, uh, but uh, also spends time uh, working up at Lincoln Laboratory. I guess. Uh, he splits his time uh, pretty regularly and uh, sort of a ambassador or bridge between the two places uh, in a sense. And uh, his, his work has to do with uh, integration technologies for, uh, for trapped ions. And, uh, you know, as you know, this is a promising candidate uh, for quantum information processing, but uh, getting the scaling that's required obviously needs a high degree of integration. And uh, in his talk today, he will report on some of the recent progress towards integrating that control technology uh, into the substrate of the ion trap uh, itself. So uh, I guess with that brief introduction, uh, Jules, if you're all set, uh, can you take it from there? All right, yes, I can. Thank you for the introduction. Also, thanks for the Brubeck to get started. That was a good choice. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, thanks for that introduction. So I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of the, or some portion of the work that I've been doing uh, in the group, uh, the trapped ion group at uh, Lincoln Laboratory, uh, focusing on integrated photonics and also integrated electronics for chip scale control of trapped ions. So um, before I get into uh, those two uh, the subjects, hang on, sorry, getting a little bit laggy there. Uh, I want to first give some introduction and motivation for uh, why we choose to use ions um, as our uh, qubit, um, qubit choice and also uh, some motivation for why we might want to integrate technology into an ion trap chip. So given that we're going to be working on uh, quantum computation or use quantum information to do computation or quantum sensing, uh, a trapped ion is a natural choice for a qubit because the uh, electronic energy levels of uh, the outermost valence electron of a trapped ion uh, are very well isolated and very easily controlled um, uh, levels, which make for a very nice uh, choice of qubit. And so we can use lasers to uh, manipulate the, uh, the state of the, uh, the uh, outermost electron between the different electronic energy levels. Um, the uh, properties or the energy spacing between these different levels are tied to physical constants. And so uh, this simplifies a lot of our calibration and it makes for a system that's very repeatable and so we don't necessarily need to worry about fabrication tolerances when we're uh, in, uh, building like a new system. Uh, and finally, there's been decades of research for, uh, in atomic physics for um, developing uh, techniques and tools for controlling uh, atoms very well. There's a few challenges uh, when, you pick, or when you choose to work with a trapped ion system. And one is that uh, you need a very uh, large vacuum chamber, like you can see here, even just to control and operate one ion. Uh, and so as we think about wanting to move to larger arrays or more complex algorithms that involve uh, many ions, uh, this experimental overhead uh, gets increasingly cumbersome. Uh, ions are also very sensitive systems. Uh, they're uh, like isolated little charged particles, and so they're very sensitive to electric field noise. Uh, and this can tend to uh, cause uh, noise and decoherence, which we'll see come up later in the presentation. So one, our, our approach at Lincoln for trying to fight this uh, increasing uh, overhead of experimental complexity is to try to take elements of this uh, control uh, from outside of the vacuum chamber and move it inside the vacuum chamber and actually move it all the way inside the, uh, the chip itself. Our approach so far has been to uh, take and then focus on one control technology at a time and then uh, see what it takes and sort of what happens when we, uh, when we put that into a trap chip and then uh, find out what the, uh, what the challenges might be and then figure out ways to overcome those challenges. 
And then our hope is that one day we might be able to combine uh, multiple control technologies all together into a picture that looks something like this, this kind of unit cell picture where everything that's required for controlling the uh, state of our ion and then for reading out the state is here in the substrate beneath the, uh, beneath the chip. Uh, this uh, kind of unit cell picture uh, fits nicely with a proposed architecture for scaling up to a system of, uh, with many ions. Uh, and this is a, a 2D array-based architecture where you have uh, these multiple zones, each zone being specialized for performing different operations. So one zone might be really good at doing uh, like quantum gates, another zone might be a very good memory zone. And then by manipulating the voltages uh, that I apply to my uh, trap electrodes out here along the edges, I can move ions uh, in and around these zones. And so you can imagine how the unit cell integration uh, fits nicely with this picture here, because I can uh, think about putting everything I need for uh, control in this zone uh, within the chip itself there at that zone. So this is a, a picture that we uh, will have in our minds uh, to motivate us going forward. So before I jump into talking about two of those uh, particular technologies, I wanna say a few words about the Lincoln Laboratory apparatus, um, trapped ion apparatus itself, uh, since it will be relevant for a few details later in the talk. Um, one important thing to note is that we use a cryogenic vacuum system, uh, which has a few uh, benefits and conveniences uh, a big one of those is that we're able to cool from uh, 295 Kelvin all the way down to 4 Kelvin, essentially overnight. And along the way, we end up with a uh, ultra high vacuum environment. This is in contrast to a, uh, like a more standard room temperature uh, vacuum system that might take many days or even weeks in order to reach the ultra high vacuum environment required for uh, trapping and maintaining long uh, trap lifetimes. Uh, a drawback of using a uh, cryogenic chamber is that our uh, Cold head up here, which does the cooling, is uh, shaking as it's undergoing this uh, a, a kind of compression and expansion cycle. And so we use a, a chamber which is uh, somewhat vibration isolated. Uh, so our uh, down here where our ion lives is a little bit isolated from the cold head up here, but there is still some residual vibration that gets through, and that will be relevant later on. For our ion species, uh, we use both uh, strontium uh, and calcium ions, which are chosen to have uh, nice uh, wavelengths. So most wavelengths for uh, controlling the internal state of the ion qubit fall within the visible uh, range of the spectrum. Some are in the near, I, near IR and some in the near UV. Uh, and then finally, uh, we use, uh, that's for controlling the internal state, but for controlling the, uh, the like, ion itself and keeping it trapped, we use a combination of RF and DC fields. Uh, I won't say too much about the RF fields. This is gonna be kind of constant throughout, uh, but the, uh, the DC fields that we use for uh, moving ions around and controlling their trap frequencies uh, will, come up in, uh, will come up in a little bit. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and jump into the first uh, subject, uh, the first thing that we focused on integrating and that's uh, voltage sources into our chamber. So the motivation for wanting to integrate electronics into uh, a, uh, or integrate voltage sources into a chamber goes something like this, where typically all of the different voltages that we need to apply to our electrodes in order to control the ion's position and state uh, are sent in sort of one at a time on a big kind of parallel bus like this, where we have uh, many independent external voltage sources out here, external filters, and then these are all sent in to a kind of like breakout box that looks something like this, where we combine all those independent signals onto a parallel cable and then send that cable into our chamber through some uh, vacuum feed through. So you can imagine this will work for a few tens of electrodes, maybe even a few hundred, um, but at some point this uh, is gonna become cumbersome. We're just gonna run out of feed throughs. Uh, and so if we could move those voltage sources inside the chamber, then instead of needing to send in analog signals, we can just send in a single bus of serial data and then convert to an analog voltage inside the chamber. Uh, there's other advantages too uh, to having our voltage sources inside closer to the ion. And one of those is that we reduce the amount of cabling between the voltage source and the ion. And this may lead to uh, sp uh, speed and bandwidth improvements in the future. The design for our DAC looks something like this. So we have a uh, R2R resistor ladder DAC, which converts a 12 bit digital code into an analog uh, voltage. This is followed by a buffer amplifier and then uh, later by a high voltage CMOS amplifier, which steps, uh, steps that up to plus minus eight volts. Uh, and this is a voltage which will then be applied to the trap electrodes. Um, this design here, we actually had fabricated in a commercial multi-project uh, foundry run. So we just send out a design with a DAC like this to uh, some foundry and we get back our chips. And uh, a lot of design work actually went into verifying the operation of these DACs at uh, 4 Kelvin and making sure that things would still function and would still stay linear, um, even at, these, at low temperature. 
So after uh, going through this uh, kind of bench testing and verifying things uh, were working, we moved on to a design which had uh, 16 of these voltage sources embedded underneath the electrodes of a trap chip. So again, this uh, same or this design was also done in a uh, multi-project run where we just send out this design and we get back trap chips. And so we've just used the uh, top two metal layers of the uh, of the process to define the trap electrodes. So this include, includes a ground plane, and then on the topmost layer we can see here uh, some uh, segmented electrodes that have been uh, defined in the metal there. And then there's uh, vias to route from the DACs underneath the electrodes up to the electrodes themselves. And a nice thing I like to point out about this picture here is that we can see that the, uh, the size of a DAC, which you can see uh, down here, is about the same as the size of a trap electrode. Uh, so here we're kind of in this unit cell, unit cell regime where uh, to add an electrode, uh, we just use the space underneath that electrode in order to uh, supply the, uh, the voltage for the electrode. So we were able to do some uh, basic demonstrations using this uh, trap. We were able to trap both uh, strontium and calcium ions. Over here, there's a little movie of a strontium ion that I'm moving uh, up and down uh, in a line over a span of about 20 microns. This is a real-time video. Uh, so I'm just uh, changing the serial data that I'm sending into the chip and uh, moving the ions uh, position uh, when I do so. Uh, we saw that uh, we had a comparable uh, ion lifetime uh, using our internal sources as we saw using external sources. And so this is encouraging. It means that uh, we're at least in the same ballpark of operation as we were uh, using our, our more stable, heavily filtered uh, sources outside the chamber. Uh, but when we want to move on to actually using this uh, ions above this chip for uh, quantum information, then we care about the uh, heat that these ions experience down to the level of single quanta. So uh, the ion, uh, we cool it down to the ground state of its uh, quantum harmonic oscillator. And we see uh, over time that it will tend to heat out of the state uh, due to uh, electric field noise uh, and, and, excuse me, equivalently uh, voltage noise uh, on our uh, trap electrodes. So for an increasing amount of voltage noise, in particular voltage noise at the ion's trap frequency, uh, we will tend to see uh, this average level of quanta in the harmonic oscillator increase. So voltage noise is a quantity, quantity we can easily, me easily measure on the bench using a spectrum analyzer. And that's what's going on in this green trace here. This is a uh, noise spectral density plot of the, uh, the voltage noise um, of the DAC. And the level that we first measure here was uh, kind of high for our typical operation. So we added to our design a analog a switch between the output of the uh, DAC, the internal DAC, and then the trap electrode. And so by opening up this uh, switch, we're able to isolate the, uh, the electrode from voltage noise from the, uh, from the op amp. And when we do so, uh, this red data here is, is measured using a spectrum analyzer. Uh, and so we see a mini order of magnitude decrease in the amount of voltage noise uh, when, this, when this switch is open. And so because our trap electrodes are like tiny little capacitors, we can actually imagine a, a mode of operation in which we close this switch and then uh, charge up our electrodes to, uh, to the voltage that we want, and then open up the switch. And then now uh, the electrodes are isolated from the voltage noise, but the voltage is maintained for some time, um, given by whatever leakage path might exist in the circuit. And we find that this leakage time is actually much longer than our typical experiment time. So uh, using this kind of scheme here, where we uh, periodically close and then reopen the switch, we were able to uh, measure a uh, heating rate using the ion itself. So we cool our ion down to the ground state and then periodically remeasure, uh, interrogate what the average motional state is. And we, uh, we see how it heats out of the ground state. So in this blue data here, this is taken with the switch closed all the time. So the ion fully exposed to uh, voltage noise uh, from, the, uh, from the amplifier and we measure a relatively higher heating rate. But then when we do this kind of periodically uh, close and reopen scheme, uh, we see a relatively lower heating rate. And this number here is encouraging because this uh, kind of heating that we see here is um, approaching the level of heating that we might expect to see with a, uh, a, a stable um, external voltage source. Um, it's still a little bit higher than we would expect uh, using our standard system. And we uh, suspect that one of the main limitations now is the, uh, the trap temperature. Uh, so when the, uh, the DACs are, are on, uh, they actually dissipate a lot of uh, heat, and then this uh, causes the, uh, the trap chip to heat up a little bit. Uh, we actually see it heats up to a few tens of Kelvin above 4 Kelvin uh, when it's uh, fully running. So in the latest version of the design, we've added yet another feature, which is uh, an in-situ uh, power down, where now uh, our, our operation gets a little bit more complex. 
And so after closing our switch, charging our electrodes, uh, and then uh, setting everything up, we can then open the switch and then power down our amplifiers and hopefully reduce the trap chip temperature before we move on to applying, uh, or before we move on to uh, executing uh, um, quantum operations using our ions. Uh, so this is work that's still ongoing and uh, interested to see uh, where things go next with this. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and switch gears from electronics over to uh, photonics. For integrated, uh, or for the motivation for wanting to integrate photonics into an ion trap, um, very similar to the motivation that I presented for wanting to integrate electronics. But in this case, the um, routing that's required to send in a new laser into uh, the chamber, so the, the lens that's required in the mirrors and all the positioning stages and all that in the viewport, um, takes up much more space than the, uh, like to send in an additional voltage, so in, in, or send in an additional wire uh, through a feed through. So in some sense, we're a lot closer to reaching the, uh, the limit at which we can't continue to cram one more lasers into our chamber. Um, so we're poised to see the advantage of using integrated photonics, I think, a little bit sooner than we are uh, than we were uh, with uh, seeing the advantage from integrated electronics. Um, there's a few other side benefits that we get uh, using integrated photonics, which uh, really stand alone from any kind of scaling argument. Uh, and one of those is an increased stability from the fact that uh, the origin of the laser beams is now registered to the trap in the same way that the ion is registered to the, to the trap. And so this will, we'll see later, will provide a little bit of vibration um, and sensitivity when we use this scheme. So our tools for integrated photonics, uh, there's uh, two of them I'll focus on. And one of those is integrated uh, waveguides and also diffraction grading couplers. These waveguides are um, uh, lithographically patterned uh, strips of high index material, which is surrounded by a relatively low index material. And so they're kind of like optical fibers that you've like miniaturized and then, and then laid out on, uh, on the, uh, uh, the substrate. And so, uh, I, you know, as a person that's normally worked a lot with optical fiber, I think of my optical fiber as being like kind of jumpers on a breadboard, and this is like the much more sophisticated version of that, and this allows us to have more um, complex and dense designs uh, when we use these techniques. Uh, the diffraction grading couplers were a little bit more exotic to me, uh, and these are uh, these ridges of a high index material surrounded by a low index material, and uh, the pattern of these ridges is done to create a constructive interference up and out of the surface of the chip up here where the ion is. And so by changing the uh, period of the spacing between these ridges and then by curving the edges of these ridges, we can actually focus uh, the, uh, the field or the, or the position of construction or inter constructive interference down onto the ion's location and reach a diffraction limited spot size in this way. Uh, so here's a, an image where you can see uh, some uh, measured data of what one of these beams looks like coming out of the, the trap chip. In this case, uh, the focusing was only happening in one direction. So in contrast to the work that I presented with integrated electronics, the photonics work, um, all of the development and fabrication is done in-house at Lincoln. We have a foundry, which is uh, just down the hall from where I work, the microelectronics laboratory, which is uh, staffed by um, a team of um, fabrication uh, experts and engineers there. And uh, within our group at Lincoln, we have a, a team which specializes in integrated photonics. And so this uh, is a team of designers and then also um, fabrication experts that are able to uh, iterate and come up with new designs and, and figure out uh, like better ways to make these devices. And so this is nice for the trapped ion team and that we can uh, work with these people and, and say, you know, like, what does it take for me to get a beam of this color at this location? And then they can go off and, and design those structures and then compare with data that, uh, with uh, structures that they've already tested and then uh, combine those into uh, like a, a full package that we can then use in, in trap ions above. Uh, so I just wanna show a few pictures of what this process design looks like. Um, over here on the left, this is an SEM image of one of these fabricated uh, grading couplers. And then on the right um, is the kind of full stack where here uh, underneath these square windows that you can see, uh, there is a, a diffraction grading of a different color or optimized for a different color underneath each one of these zones. And I would typically trap my ion uh, here, 50 microns above this location. So once we've got these uh, chips, in order to get light onto the chips, uh, we use a fiber block array. And so this is uh, a glass block that has a linear array of optical fiber, um, each for uh, different colors, different core diameters, uh, for the different wavelengths that we need for controlling strontium. 
And we send our different colors into, these, uh, into this fiber block array and then move the fiber block array close to the edge of the chip where there's a bunch of waveguides that um, have all terminated here at the edge of the chip. And then uh, bring everything into close alignment and then we couple light from those uh, external optical fibers onto the chip. And then we can see the light gets routed right around and then eventually comes uh, here out of the grating. So we can measure the light that comes out of the grating, uh, get this alignment optimized, and then freeze it into place uh, using uh, some two-stage epoxy that you see here. And so as it turns out, um, of all the engineering challenges you know, that went into uh, this design, uh, choosing the right glue uh, was a significant part of the challenge. Uh, it's, it was, turns out it was hard to find something that was mechanically stable, uh, was not terrible for vacuum, and also something that could survive the, uh, the cool down from 295 Kelvin all the way down to 4 Kelvin. So you know, yet uh, another um, engineering challenge for this whole uh, process that you see here. So once we've got the, uh, the light uh, aligned to the chip and then coming out of the chip, um, we can do some measurements. Uh, this is data taken on the bench here. And so we can see uh, light. This is uh, false colored light, uh, but the actual beams are, are uh, different colors, which are sort of correspond to the colors that you see here in this slide. Uh, and these are all the different wavelengths that are required for ionizing and then cooling and then controlling the, uh, the quantum state of, uh, of a strontium ion, which would be uh, trapped here where the beams are intersecting. Uh, so what we're looking at here is a series of images that's taken with a high numerical aperture microscope that uh, starts out focused on the plane with the gratings and then is uh, uh, gradually backed away up and through the 50 micron uh, focal plane where the ion will eventually sit. So uh, again, in correspondence to uh, some bench data, we're able to uh, look at the behavior of the chip uh, like uh, on the bench outside of the vacuum chamber, and then we can put the chip into the vacuum chamber and then do a corresponding measurement using the ion. So uh, by controlling the, the DC fields that are applied to these uh, outer segmented electrodes over here, we can move our ion along a central axis here and then through uh, the beams that are coming out of these uh, gratings, as we saw in the previous slide. And uh, by doing various measurements, we're able to determine uh, what the intensity of the beam is for these different colors that the ion is seeing at a particular location. Um, the exact experiment that we do um, varies depending on the wavelength that we're trying to analyze. In some cases, it's as simple as just measuring uh, brightness or a fluorescence count, but in other cases, we actually need to perform some kind of quantum operation in order to extract the intensity. But in all these cases, we can back out what that intensity is. And so uh, here on these uh, plots uh, below, we can see ion data, which is reported by the, uh, the dots here in close correspondence with uh, data, which is extracted from the microscope measurement, which was shown in the solid lines. So again, this is one of these nice, uh, like very pleasing to me demonstrations where you're able to use the ion as this like very like fancy um, analyzer or something that's much easier to do outside of the vacuum chamber. <laughs> so I, I think it makes for a, a cool uh, demonstration. It's always good to see that the things are in nice correspondence. Uh, so I mentioned before that there is an advantage to using integrated photonics just for uh, vibration isolation. So uh, normally uh, our uh, cold head is shaking just a little bit uh, and our ion is shaking along with it. And we have a very narrow uh, line width uh, qubit transition that we're trying to address using some external beam. And so no matter how stable we make this external beam, if the ion's shaking a little bit, it's actually seeing a Doppler shifted version of that beam. And this essentially or effectively leads to a, uh, a line width broadening of, uh, of that laser. And so this broadening uh, shows up in our qubit measurements as decoherence. And we can get a, or we can tease out this signal by looking at a uh, Ramsey contrast or a decay in Ramsey contrast uh, for a fixed interrogation time. So all this to say that uh, the Ramsey contrast is a good uh, measure of how um, coherent our ion is and how coherent this operation that we're trying to do is. And so with uh, a decreased Ramsey contrast, uh, this means that uh, there's more frequency broadening, more, more decoherence happening. So using uh, an external beam, we intentionally uh, defeat the vibration isolation between our shaking uh, uh, cold head or our shaking um, cryocooler and then the cold head where the ion sits and uh, increase the amount of vibration that it's undergoing. Uh, the video you could see here, this was like the point of maximum vibration. Uh, so the ions really kind of like flopping around uh, due to all this vibration. Uh, 
Uh, and what we expect to see with the external beam is that uh, this uh, Doppler shifting and, la and laser broadening gets worse and worse. And sure enough, this is what we see. Uh, so on this x-axis here, this is increased amount of vibrational coupling. Uh, we see that the uh, Ramsey contrast uh, error si or um, Ramsey contrast signal goes down um, as we uh, as we do this uh, or increase this vibrational coupling with the external beam. But with the internal beam, now uh, this extra shaking, the uh, laser beam is actually shaking along with the ion since they're both registered to the trap, which is registered to the uh, vibrating cold head. And so uh, in this case, uh, we see that uh, the Ramsey contrast is fairly um, unaffected by the additional uh, coupling that we've introduced. So this is a nice benefit, even aside from any kind of scaling that you might want to say or unit cell picture or any of that, uh, in any situation where you might be sensitive to um, vibrations, uh, it turns out integrated photonics uh, have uh, this nice advantage. And so systems um, like portable systems, like a portable uh, sensor or clock based on ions could benefit from using integrated photonics. So one last uh, uh, cool demonstration I wanna talk about using integrated photonics is uh, based on a, a new uh, generation of this uh, integrated photonic trap. And so in this trap, we actually have uh, two different uh, zones, uh, I'm going to focus on, um, you can see these two zones each have uh, several windows below them, and I'm going to focus on just one of these windows. And so this is a global beam where I have a, a single uh, qubit beam, which comes from one waveguide followed by a 3D splitter that splits that light into two different zones. Uh, so any pulse that I apply to that, that waveguide will then show up as a laser pulse at these two locations. But because I have all of these uh, segmented electrodes on the outside here, I can actually independently control the position of these two ions. And so I apply some uh, global scheme of pulses, and then I can independently move those ions into or out of the beam to decide which ions I want to be participating in that particular interaction. So this is a nice way that we might be able to multiplex um, operations on a larger um, uh, uh, trap architecture. So here's some uh, initial data uh, where we uh, do such an operation. Uh, so I'm making measurements, or here uh, we're making measurements of two ions in, a left and, in the left and right zone, uh, and then bringing them out into those beams to either interact or not interact with the qubit beams, and then back into the middle to, uh, to measure them. Uh, in this upper trace here, uh, we can see that one of these ions is experiencing the qubit beam. So this red data is based on the right ion. And what happens when it's placed into the beam is that it's undergoing an oscillation between the, uh, the two levels of the qubit. So we're seeing Rabi flops between those two levels. Whereas the, uh, the blue data here, which is based on the left ion is relatively unaffected. So during this operation, we had the right ion in the beam and the left ion placed slightly outside of the beam. Uh, but then in this uh, data down here below, uh, in this case, we place both ions in the beam uh, during the global operation. So now both are participating in the, uh, in the Rabi oscillation. So this is work that's still ongoing. There's still some technical challenges to be overcome in order to try to get these uh, Ravi oscillation frequencies to be better matched. Uh, but I already, now I think it's a pretty exciting demonstration of what kind of parallel operations you might be able to see in the future. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, wrap up. Uh, I've talked about um, integrated electronics and how they might offer potential uh, benefits for increasing bandwidth and also how they might offer uh, an advantage for scaling up to larger numbers of electrodes. And then I've talked about uh, integrated photonics, how this could also lead to some scaling advantages and then some uh, benefits from stability and from uh, multiplexing that might uh, stand alone even without uh, scaling to larger numbers of ions. And so uh, with that, I think that's it for me and I'd like to open up for questions. All right, Jules, thanks. Uh, great talk, uh, great overview of uh, the progress uh, for integrated control. As uh, we mentioned up front, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, I guess uh, I am not seeing questions at this point in the chat, that, that could be a Zoom thing. Uh, so I, I guess uh, if you do have questions, why don't you just uh, unmic and, uh, and ask them and that's probably the easiest way to do it. I have a question. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Um, my question was, if you, as you keep scaling this up, uh, these traps up in the in these chips, you will need to be able to do switching in your photonics. How do you plan to pursue that? Yeah, a great question. So there's uh, work that's been, uh, or, or 
in early stages now for having on-chip uh, modulators, but uh, my uh, knowledge of photonics uh, ends sometime around when things start to get active. And so uh, I can't speak uh, too much to that now, but I'll say that there is some work ongoing in order to develop on-chip modulators using our, uh, the process that I've talked about here. All right, other questions? Hey, Jules. Um, I had a question, really great talk. Um, so my question was, you have four different grading couplers, right? And then each of the four different um, grading couplers is a different wavelength, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so I was wondering um, why you, like what the significance of those wavelengths is and why there's four different ones. Ah, sure, yeah. So I, I, I glazed over a lot of the, uh, or the reason why we need all these different wavelengths. Um, so there's a couple different things that we do uh, with lasers in addition to just uh, controlling the, uh, the, like, the state of the qubit. Um, uh, doing those kind of like Rabi oscillations that I, I showed in the data on the very last slide. Um, we also use uh, two laser colors for ionizing. So we send in like neutral atoms and then uh, we hit it with uh, uh, two different uh, laser colors in order to um, remove that outermost or one of the outermost valence electrons and then go down to just a single um, valence electron in our uh, ionized strontium that we like to work with. Um, there's also two laser colors that are used for doing uh, laser cooling, Doppler cooling, if you might be familiar with this, which is really too much to get into. And then we finally have like our, our very uh, ultra stable um, narrow qubit laser. And then there's another laser that we use to uh, clear out the qubit state. So altogether, it's a six total wavelengths that we need for um, doing full control over a single ion species uh, for this particular type of ion. Okay, great. Thank you. This is John Bolzakelli from IBM Research. I enjoyed your talk. Uh, one question, question actually, uh, partly goes back to the question on the uh, modulation or, or uh, sort of uh, of the laser beams, but it's also I'm also curious on the electrical, which is what kind of time scales do you need to change, say, the DC controls and the voltages and so forth for an actual sort of quantum computing operation, and as well, and also what kind of bandwidth do you need on the modulation of the light? Uh, sure. Um, so. I guess starting with the, uh, the DC uh, control voltages, um, it depends a lot on what operations you might wanna perform. So I, I, I kind of like lumped a bunch of different uh, things you might wanna do with ions together. Uh, but if you were doing like a clock operation or some kind of sensor, then uh, maybe you only care about like recalibrating those, those uh, like voltages over some kind of like long duty cycle, maybe seconds, uh, and that would be sufficient. Um, but for doing something which is more complex, like doing like ions operations where you're moving ions between and around zones, um, and in those cases, you might want up to like tens of megahertz or 100 megahertz uh, bandwidth, uh, kind of as much as you can get, though, uh, when you tend to try to move things faster and faster, you have to think more about exactly how you're doing those motion protocols so as not to excite the ions motion as you kind of like move it around quickly between these zones. Um, so I guess the short answer to that is like, you know, 10, 10 megahertz would be would be fine, but 100 megahertz would be would be cool. Um, and so the uh, the bandwidth for the optical modulation, I'd say so the like the bandwidth required for like amplitude modulation, just switching laser beams off and on. Uh, for this, we kind of want pulses uh, that's around like a few microseconds. And uh, this is just for our particular choice of qubit, which I didn't say much about. Our, our optical qubit were kind of governed by um, like the the like. Robbie frequency, like how quickly we're able to switch back and forth between these two states. And so we, we tend to want to be able to pulse as, as fast as we can move between those states. So we sometimes want to do an operation where we like fully go up from like the lower qubit level to the upper qubit level. Um, in terms of being able to quickly frequency modulate the light, um, that's you can be a little bit more uh, flexible. Um, it depends, I think, too much on the operation to say for sure. OK, thanks. Hi, uh, I enjoyed your talk. Um, I had a question about the glue, actually. No, yeah. It's p potentially less interesting, but important nonetheless. Um, I was just wondering, like, what sort of challenges you ran into, like, when you were, uh, you know, doing your, your curing and cooling down and what sort of power requirements you have and, you know, how easy it was to meet those requirements? Yeah, so... Uh... This, like, it, so much of the saga was uh, just the glue, so I'm, like, excited to talk about it, and I could probably say, like, too much about it if I was given the opportunity to. Um, but uh, actually, for a lot of, like, previous work that was done with, uh, like, doing this kind of packaging, 
um, you'll see like a glue where they just allow the glue to, to go into the interface between like the fiber array and the edge of the chip or something like that. Um, but it turns out for some of the wavelengths that we wanted to work with, uh, like 420 nanometers and sort of like below that range, um, a lot of um, epoxies in blue undergo uh, what's called yellowing or they become opaque uh, when they experience this like blue or more UV light. And so one challenge is like an epoxy that isn't going to like wick into that interface. You wanted to just like keep the two together and then glue on the outside. And so we needed something relatively viscous. Um, we also needed something that didn't outgas. So at one point we were looking at a, a material that was more like a potting material, um, but we were afraid that it could um, like increase the, uh, the, the pressure in the, in the chamber too much, uh, particularly close up to the ion. So that's a challenge. Uh, and then just finding something that was uh, fairly rigid as we cooled it down was the final thing, because it, it turns out that those two requirements tend to push in the direction of something that's brittle. Um, and so for that, we just had to sort of increase the structural integrity of the, of the whole package. Um, and, and recently we actually moved in the direction of having a, um, a kind of two-layer design where we have a shelf underneath the trap chip and then the, the fiber ray is kind of glued down onto a shelf. And this increases the stability even further. I see. Good, good luck with your future glowing. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, a follow-up question to that. Do you use mode converters in the, in the waveguides to... Uh, multiple, what? To uh, multiple what in the waveguide? I'm sorry. Mode converters so that you get more uh, alignment tolerant edge coupling. I, I'm sorry. I'm still not hearing what you're saying. I think it's mode, mode converters. Oh, mode converters. No. Uh, well, uh, for us, we, we we taper toward the edge of the of the chip, but uh, but that's the extent of the mode meshing that's done for this. Yeah, I have a, another question about the the photonics. So, first, in in with these different uh, wavelengths, these ratings designed for different wavelengths, do you achieve the focus tightly, like all of them in the same spot? And how does how do like fabrication tolerances affect this thing? And overall, your uh, your operations, your ion operations? Yeah, this is a great question. So uh, a lot of the development um, in this like process, like where things are going now, is uh, trying to um, improve the, I think, repeat repeatability of our process and also to better predict um, like how uh, things are going to end up fabricated so that we can better um, like nail uh, the ion. Uh, because in this case, uh, actually, uh, might be a little bit hard to see uh, from this here. There's a different picture that shows uh, the convergence of the beams above the trap, but they actually all converge slightly above where the ion really is. Um, and so in, in the like experiment that I talk about here, uh, it wasn't so much of a problem because we weren't focusing down to this like ultimate diffraction limit. We were actually only focusing in one direction. So the beams were kind of like ovals um, where, they, uh, where they saw the ion or where the ion saw the beams. Um, and so it wasn't too much of a problem there. Uh, but when it comes time to uh, like try to reach this ultimate diffraction limit, then we will need better characterization of uh, our, our process so that we're better able to predict where the beams are going to go. I see. Thanks. And then follow up to that. Uh, if you have two of these traps nearby, how do you expect noise from the like, grating couplers can be scattering? It can scatter light a little bit around or so. So how do you expect that noise to affect your operations? It, it depends on like which wavelength, because uh, at the end of the day, there's really like one wavelength that we're most sensitive to when we do our readout, and that's the same uh, wavelength that we use for doing our, our cooling and fluorescence detection. And so if uh, like this can actually lead to crosstalk just from like light from the wrong grading getting into our, our imaging system when we're detecting the state and doing mm -hmm. our measurements. Um, and so, uh, in, in the work that was done here, we use some kind of like baffling in our image, imaging system to try to prevent the scattered light from, from getting into our detector. Uh, but in future designs, I think they're, they're working now on um, developing uh, via walls. Uh, and so just like walls of metal um, that are integrated into the, uh, the substrate to prevent scatter from one grading from getting over to a different grading. Nice. Thanks, very nice work. Hey, a uh, couple, couple of uh, questions in the chat, Jules. Uh, I asked a uh, typical lifetime of the strontium ions before they hit a wall. Uh, yeah, so uh, that this is a nice thing about the cryogenic system is that once you've cooled down to four Kelvin, you kind of eliminate um, most of your background gases. 
And so our uh, trap lifetimes um, can be is, you know, several hours. Um, sometimes when everything is, is cool and behaving really well, it can be um, upwards of you know, days. Um, but in this uh, integrated photonics process, um, our, our the system at the bottom of the cold had to, had to be a little bit more open than it usually is to allow for these fibers to get through. And so uh, this left us open a little bit more to uh, background gas. And so we saw uh, trap lifetimes that were kind of more around, um, you know, tens of minutes, maybe an hour. Okay. Uh, somebody else asked, uh, are you planning on realizing active devices such as modulators and, uh, and amorphous materials such as the silicon nitride? Uh, yeah, there's definitely work ongoing with the modulators. As I said before, I, I haven't, I'm not sure what the state of that is, uh, but I would say that that's another one of these technologies that we're kind of like focusing now on the like design of the modulators. And then later on, we'll see what it takes to, to integrate those into it, into a trap chip. Okay. And then uh, finally, somebody asked about um, why you use niobium electrodes and how you pattern it. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the pattern is just the, the same kind of like um, lithographic uh, like uh, stuff as the other things where you like lay down uh, metal and then do uh, resist and etch. Um, but uh, the niobium, I think, is compatible with our process. Uh, I think it, at first we wanted to try to use a superconducting material uh, because uh, we thought that it would limit uh, the um, voltage noise um, above, uh, like due to, to Johnson noise from its distance in the trap metal electrodes. Uh, it turns out that didn't really have much of an effect. This was something that was done just with like a single layer metal uh, trap. Um, but ever since then, it's kind of just been our standard go-to metal. And so we like to you know compare everything apples to apples. All right, um, maybe time for one more question. If there's any burning questions out there. Uh, hey, Jose, this is a really nice talk. Uh, I uh, I think the grating coupler is, is a quite neat approach. Uh, could you just uh, comment on the general challenges or any improvement needed you know, for using grating couplers? Uh, so one of those challenges was already kind of alluded to and that's um, just figuring out um, how to best predict and then control the, uh, the index of the, uh, of the ridges that you see here because this actually affects like the, the angle with which the, like, the beams are diffracted when they hit these, this thing. And so it affects like where this focus position actually ends up. And so that's a, that's a pretty big challenge. And then um, also the resolution with which you can um, fabricate these ridges um, affects, you know, like how finely you can make your features and how, uh, you know, how much you can tune um, the, what the focus beam looks like. Uh, and so I think that's just a, a big fabrication challenge. I know they're doing lots of tricks now to work on ways of improving that design. I see. So how about, how about the bandwidth of the grating covers? Uh, the, the bandwidth, um, it, well, so we have uh, grading couplers that work down to, I think, into the, into the UV. I think there's some at 370 nanometers that have been tested. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, maybe we'll stop there in terms of questions. I, I'm sure if uh, you have other questions, uh, you can get a, uh, a hold of Jules directly and, uh, and follow up with him. But uh, but uh, thank you, Jules. Uh, I guess a virtual round of applause. Uh, great talk again, and uh, thank you for for uh, joining us today uh, at the Nano Talk to present it. So, uh, with that, uh, thank everybody else for for uh, tuning in today. I uh, just wanted to mention that the uh, next talk is on Tuesday, March thirtieth, uh, and it'll be given by uh, Maximilian Olbert, um, also somebody working uh, out at Lincoln Laboratory, and he'll be talking about practical fiber batteries for uh, wearable uh, devices. So hope you all can uh, join in again for that. And uh, with that, uh, we'll say goodbye. Everybody take care. And uh, again, thanks for joining.